Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and today we're going to be discussing a really interesting case that I recently posted um, as a whole slide uh, digital image on Kiko. Um, and this is, uh, I did something a little unusual compared to my normal routine. I post the case and let people um, say what they thought it was as an unknown mystery diagnosis, and now I'm going to make the video. So I had the uh, benefit of seeing all the different things people guessed. Many of you correctly uh, realize that this is histoid leprosy, which is a spindle cell rich pseudotumoral form of lepromatous leprosy. And, uh, but the other thing was that some people guessed that this was a spindle cell tumor of some sort. Well, don't feel bad. The couple of times that I have had first uh, heard of histoid leprosy um, during training and even in practice, I had seen it presented as an unknown at derm dermatopathology meetings. And before they revealed the fight stain, I thought this is a dermatofibroma or something. And then they showed the fight stain and I thought, oh, I'm going to totally miss this if I see it in real life. Well, fortunately, I ended up figuring this one out in real life. But part of that is because I got lucky. The, derm the dermatologist gave me good clinical information and gave me two biopsies. And both of them were nice deep punches that allowed me to see some extra features, which I'll show you in a minute, that helped me figure out that we were definitely dealing with lepromatous leprosy and not a neoplasm. So I'll give you, give you more of that uh, here in a minute. But what we see is that there's a dense infiltrate of spindle cells uh, filling much of the, the superficial to mid dermis. And of course, you're going to want to zoom in right on, away on that. And, and we will we'll talk about it. But I want to point out something here. Don't forget to look at the background. Okay, in any case, whether it's a melanoma or whatever it is, always look at the whole context. Sometimes I'll put a slide down and I'll see a big lesion and I'll think, whoa, let me look around before I go look at that because I know I'm going to get so um, enthralled with what's going on in here that I might forget to check the background at the end of the case and I don't ever want to do that. So I try to make it a habit of looking at everything first at low power and then zooming in at the key areas. All right, but let's go back. The spindle cells here are kind of bland, plump, fibrohistiocytic looking cells. So very much like a dermatofibroma. Some cases can be kind of story form. Um, and by fibrohistiocytic, we mean that they're kind of overlapping features between fibroblasts and histiocytes. And probably there are a mixture of both cell types here, as well as some lymphocytes, the little tiny dark, almost black looking um, guys scattered throughout here. Um, you can see that there's collagen trapping. So again, a reason that you might consider, oh, this could just be a dermatofibroma. But there's a few clues even in the midst of the spindle cell infiltrate, that should, should clue you in that this is not dermatofibroma. In fact, this may be an infectious process. Number one is that you're going to find some scattered plasma cells in here. Now, I don't know if that's in every case, but I'll tell you this. I've seen plasma cells uh, in a handful of cases now that helped me recognize that something was an infectious granuloma or an infectious pseudotumoral process like this. And so the plasma cells, if I see them in the background, um, of granulomas or of a, of a fibrohistiocytic uh, um, proliferation, it makes me think, could this maybe be an infectious pseudotumoral process rather than a true neoplasm? Now, of course, plasma cells can be present alongside neoplasms. Um, it's, uh, not, it's not impossible, but it just it's a clue. I've not really seen that in books, uh, but I definitely noticed it in practice. So uh, that's one thing that makes me think about infection. The other thing here is that we begin to see these circular spaces filled with granular, grungy, purplish blue material here. There's some more right here. And I'll show you a closer, higher power view in a minute of those. Those are called globi. And globi, for those of you who know about leprosy, uh, this is a characteristic feature of the lepromatous form of leprosy. Now, the subclassification of leprosy is really complicated, and my colleagues living in uh, countries like India or other countries where leprosy is still endemic probably know way more about this than I ever will. But the very simplified way that I'll explain it is that there are two ends of a spectrum for leprosy, kind of like how there are two ends of a spectrum for tuberculosis. At one end, you have a really good immune response. That end in leprosy is called tuberculoid leprosy or posse bacillary leprosy. There's a lot of well-formed, tight, almost sarcoidosis-like granulomas, and they track along nerves. And when you do a fight stain, the organisms are very rare. Sometimes you can't find any at all because the person's immune response is really good. 
At the other end of the spectrum, what we have here is lepromatous leprosy, and that's multivacillary leprosy where there are numerous organisms, the person's immune response is not well formed, and instead of nice tight granulomas, you get these loose sheets of kind of frothy histiocytes. It's still histiocyte rich, but this definitely doesn't look like the granuloma of, say, sarcoidosis, right? These are not well formed tight granulomas. They're loose granulomas, and the cells are foamy or frothy because they're filled with numerous organisms. And I'll show you the fight stain in just a minute here. So the, um, the, uh, that's lepromatous leprosy. And histoid leprosy is just a variant, a pseudotumoral variant of lepromatous leprosy, where for some reason, the, um, the body begins to produce a bunch of histiocytes and some spindled fibroblasts along with it. And that makes a nodule um, or a papule on the patient's skin that both clinically and microscopically could look like a, a neoplastic process. So let's go away from the main spindle cell mass and look down below. And this is what I was talking about. Don't forget to check your background because in the background, we begin to see uh, lymphohistiocytic infiltrate around eccrine coils. And we also, in the other piece here, same thing you can see down here. These are the features of typical lepromatous leprosy, okay? If you ignore the big nodule up above, these perivascular and perineural infiltrates are exactly what you'd expect in the conventional type of lepromatous leprosy. So if you see linear uh, histiocytic infiltrate, if it's linear or serpiginous, that probably means that it's following along vessels and nerves, and that should be a clue for leprosy whenever you see histiocytes or granulomas tracking along nerves and vessels. And even if you don't see the nerve in the section you're looking at, if it's around vessels, then it probably is around nerves too, because the nerve and the vessel, of course, run alongside each other okay so that background is very good for um for lepromatous uh, leprosy now let's look at some other pictures here this is the clinical photo these are clinical photos of the patients uh, and you can see here that the patient has these erythematous firm uh, papules on the arms but the patient also has these flat patches that are erythematous all over the trunk and this is an elderly man and um, when I um, talked to the dermatologist, I said, well, this patient probably has had exposure to armadillos. Armadillos are animals that have the, the kind of heart. They're mammals. They have a hard outer shell. I don't know if you have them in your uh, country, but in any case, uh, in, uh, in the United States, in the south of the United States, we have armadillos. And the nine bands at armadillo carries leprosy in the wild, depending on where you live. Uh, uh, some percentage of the wild armadillo population has um, a bunch of leprae organisms in them. And so this is a known thing that uh, in the South United States, like in Florida and Texas, Louisiana, that people can get leprosy from handling armadillos for various reasons. So this patient taught me an important lesson though. I, I talked to the dermatologist and I said, what has this patient been doing with armadillos? And she said, as far as we know, he has never traveled um, anywhere that's a, a leprosy endemic area and he has um, never touched or handled armadillos. So this is the first time that I realized, you know, maybe, maybe sometimes people can get leprosy not from directly touching armadillos, but I couldn't figure out how. And then later it came out that uh, he worked uh, out in the, in the yard of the field out in, on his uh, land and there were lots of armadillos around living there and he had seen armadillos. And so he was working kind of in the dirt where these armadillos frequented. So from that, we kind of postulated that maybe leprosy can be spread through contaminated soil. And we've seen several cases now and recently published a paper about that. I'll mention at the end of the video. All right, here is a close-up uh, look from the case I just showed you, and I had to go at real high power. These are a, a better view of the globi. You can see that frothy blue stuff. Those are the leprae organisms, okay? And note again, the plasma cells. Here's another view, and you can see the, the big histiocytes, the squished lymphocytes in here, and globus, globus, globus is the singular, globi is the plural. And uh, these are, again, very typical of lepromatous uh, leprosy. And also you can see similar um, vacuoles filled with organism in atypical mycobacteria infections. And uh, that's actually the most common form of uh, mycobacterial infection that I see in my practice. Leprosy um, uh, in, my, in my former uh, practice in Arkansas, uh, I, uh, I just recently changed jobs um, and work in Pennsylvania now, but the, um, the, in, in Arkansas, we would see maybe two or three cases of leprosy per year um, about, and, um, but um, atypical mycobacteria much more common than that.
in our area at least. And here is what you've been waiting for, the fight stain. And of course, there's numerous organisms and throughout the entire lesion, there were this many organisms. This is just a close up view so you can see the elongated rod shape. And they're just packed together in, um, in the uh, McKee um, uh, uh, Derm textbook, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, he mentions that, uh, that they often are formed in sheaves like, like wheat, you know, gathered together on the field. And that's what you can see. They're like packed together where all the bacilli are kind of clumped together in the same direction. And I like that, uh, that visual analogy. So that's uh, the fight stain here, which is the form of acid fast stain that I like to use in dermatopathology because it will pick up uh, regular other types of mycobacteria, but also leprosy. Here's a view from uh, one of those areas down deep to the spindle cell nodule, and you can see the background uh, leprae organisms, and also look at this little nerve here, and there's leprae right there in the perineurium. And there's a closer view, kind of granular um, and pixelated, but I wanted to try to get a closer view there. And something interesting I learned about this case, this is a PAS with diastase uh, stain. So I didn't realize it, but evidently leprae organisms sometimes will stain at least weekly on PAS stain. I thought that was really fascinating that the organisms are so numerous, you could see them on the PAS. And uh, sorry, it was hard to get a picture of these. They're so tiny to get, the, uh, to get them caught with a camera. You really have to go in uh, closer than the camera can sometimes handle. Now, this was a biopsy, uh, biopsy two from the same patient, which was from one of the patch areas. And you can see that there's none of that cellular spindle infiltrate, but there are perivascular and perineural infiltrates composed of lymphocytes and frothy, foamy histiocytes, which are laden with leprae organisms. And again, here's a vessel and a nerve side by side wrapped by this infiltrate. And there's the fight stain from that. So this was a really nice example of the histoid variant of lepromatous leprosy. If you want to learn more about this and other things about leprosy, particularly about endemic leprosy in Arkansas and other parts of the South, uh, the Southern United States uh, in regards to armadillo exposure, you can check out our paper that we just got published ahead of print in American Journal of Dermatopathology. And I published this with my colleagues from University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences and one of my former um, UAMS medical students, Dr. Sarah Carlock, who is now a dermatology resident. So we're very proud of her. She did a really excellent job with putting together this case series. And what we mention in here is that we think that sometimes the uh, armadillos can shed the leprae organisms and then the organisms, because they have their obligate intracellular organisms, they can live inside soil dwelling amoebas for various amounts of time. And other people have shown, uh, other researchers have shown that, that that can happen. So we think that that's probably how um, patients and who are not in an endemic area where, where patients, uh, where people normally have leprosy, uh, but they're near armadillos, but not directly touching them. We think that probably they can pick it up from the soil. And we've seen multiple cases, which we talk about in here. And I, I believe probably what happens is people get exposed. And then as they get older, their immune system decreases with old age, um, so-called immunoparesis of old age. And then that allows the organisms that have kind of been just smoldering under their skin to kind of explode and start dividing and growing. And then they present as older adults. And many of our patients were, uh, were elderly. And I see the same thing actually with um, atypical mycobacterial infections, patients that are older adults and didn't have any recent uh, trauma or injury, and yet suddenly present with numerous acid fast bacilli in their skin, but not systemically. So that's kind of my theory about that is that I think a lot of these people probably got exposed a long time ago and the organism just kind of hung out there. And then eventually when the immune system went down, it gave the organism an opportunity to grow. So this is, a, a as you can tell, a topic I'm really passionate about and fascinated by. And I would love input from my colleagues who live and work in areas where there is endemic um, uh, leprosy and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. And, and also tell me, how often do you see the histoid form of leprosy? Is it common or rare? Because it's hard for me to really get a feel for it since we don't see much leprosy uh, in the United States. Uh, thank you so much for watching. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please uh, subscribe and click like and uh, leave me your comments down below. Thank you.